Oh, hi there. Hello. This is an overview of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Easily one of the most famous bloodlines of the classical world. You were probably introduced to the concept of family trees in middle school. You were likely introduced to the concept of family poles in Game of Thrones. Well, the Ptolemies were really neither. There aren't quite enough branches to make a tree, and there are too many branches to make a pole. The Ptolemies were more like a family pretzel. It all started with Alexander III of Macedon's conquest of the Persian Empire. Alexander made an odd decision to take a detour through Egypt on his decades-long manhunt for Persian King Darius III. Why Alexander opted for this route isn't entirely known, but there were likely multiple reasons. The first reason would likely be Alexander's ego, knowing that he would be seen as a liberator instead of a tyrant by the people of Egypt, as they absolutely hated living under Persian rule. Another reason is most likely food. Alexander had an army to feed, and Egypt was the agricultural hub of the Mediterranean. Alexander could boost his ego as well as his belly in one fell swoop. After Alexander's death in 323 BCE, his empire would be divided up between his generals, who acted as his diadochia, which is a Greek word for successor. The best known of his diadochi are Seleucus, Antigonus, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy. The latter of which was handed a kingdom in Egypt where he and his successors would rule for 14 generations, kind of, until Rome would incorporate Egypt as part of the Roman Empire following the exile and self-deletion of one of history's most romanticized characters, Cleopatra VII. Ptolemy the first Soter, or savior, would marry Berenice I, who was the daughter of Princess Antigone and Megas of Macedon, a nobleman about which very little is known. Berenice was also the maternal granddaughter of Cassander, who was the brother of the regent of Alexander's empire, Antipater. You can see from here how we're definitely keeping the family matters of the empire pretty close to the chest. Ptolemy and Berenice would have three children, Arsinoe II, Philotera, and the most interesting, Ptolemy II Philadelphus. Philadelphus means love of sibling, but speaking literally, it means love of brother. Philadelphia would have been a more fitting name for Ptolemy II, as he would not only consort his cousin, Arsinoe I, but also his sister Arsinoe II. Ptolemy II wasn't the only son of Ptolemy who kept his namesake, however, as his son Ptolemy Cyrannus from his previous marriage to Eurydice of Egypt, Berenice's cousin, was assumed to be the heir apparent to his throne in Egypt. Getting confused yet? Just wait. When Ptolemy Cyrannus was passed up for the throne of Egypt in favor of Ptolemy II, conflict ensued between the half-siblings which led to Ptolemy Serraunos being exiled from Egypt. Ptolemy Serraunos would continue his fight for the Egyptian throne going to the court of Lysimachus where the court was divided on the issue of Ptolemy Serrano's claim to the throne. Lysimachus himself had been wed to Ptolemy II's sister Arsinoe II. On the other hand, Lysimachus' heir, Agathocles was the husband of Ptolemy Serrano's sister Lysandra, Ptolemy I's daughter from his marriage to Eurydice. Lysimachus opted in the end to side with Ptolemy II when he agreed to marry Lysimachus' daughter, and Ptolemy II's cousin, Arsinoe I. As it turns out, this may not have been the best decision for Lysimachus, as the continued conflict led to the execution of his heir Agathocles and the complete collapse of Lysimachus' kingdom. After which, Arsinoe II returned to Egypt where she would clash with her sister-in-law, Arsinoe I, which eventually led to Arsinoe I being charged with conspiracy and exiled, and Ptolemy II would later marry his sister Arsinoe II. Sibling marriage was pretty much the norm in Egypt in terms of succession, but to the Greeks, much like in modern times, it was considered incestuous and beneath, while some Greeks, such as the poet Theocritus defended the marriage by comparing it to Zeus' marriage to his older sister Hera. Others in Greece were not so supportive. Sotades, for instance, mocked the marriage with famous lines such as, you're sticking your prick in an unholy hole. While a fun turn of phrase, he would later regret his words. Sotades was exiled and imprisoned, but managed to escape after many years in solitude. He was recaptured on the island of Kanus, where he was locked up in a chest and thrown into the sea. Think about that the next time you're crying about freedom of speech. Jesus <coughs> Christ, we're just now moving on to the third generation. While Ptolemy II is best known for his marriage to his sister, Arsinoe II, because of the name Philadelphus, they did not have any children together. Ptolemy II's eldest male child came from his first marriage to Arsinoe I in the form of Ptolemy III Eurgetes, the sire of the third generation of Ptolemies. Ptolemy III Eurgetes, or the benefactor, presided over one of Egypt's wealthiest periods. While his heirship was in question early in his life due to the conspiracy charges and exile of his mother, he was restored as the heir apparent in Egypt and took the throne in 246 BCE. Ptolemy III would be married to Berenice II, no blood relation to his grandmother, Berenice I. Berenice II was the former wife and widow of Demetrius I, the king of Cyrene, who succeeded Megas I, the son of Ptolemy III's grandmother Berenice I from her first marriage to Philip of Macedon. Now, when I mentioned that Berenice II was the wife and widow of Demetrius I, I don't mean that she was a bereaved woman mourning the death of her husband. Quite the opposite, she was the one who <coughs> killed him. Berenice II was originally pledged to Ptolemy III as a reunification of Egypt and Cyrene after Megas had rebelled against Ptolemy II years earlier. However, when Megas I kicked the bucket, Berenice's mother Apama II, backed out of the agreement, forcing her daughter to wed the antagonid prince Demetrius, making him king of Cyrene. 
After Demetrius' murder at the hands of his wife, Cyrene was under a republican government for four years until the Ptolemy III and Berenice II were married in 246 BC. During the Third Syrian War, where he famously invaded and was victorious against the Seleucid Empire, an empire taking its namesake from one of Alexander the Great's successors, he was forced to return to Egypt due to a revolt that was squashed shortly afterward. This uprising caused Ptolemy III to form a closer bond with the Egyptian priestly elite, a bond that would lead to the decree of Canopus, written in Egyptian hieroglyphs, Demotic, and Greek, proclaiming Ptolemy III, Berenice II, and their daughter Berenice III as gods. This decree would be carved into multiple memorial stones and steles. This is very important in terms of history as it would set a trend for all important scripts such as this from Huron to be written in multiple languages. It is because of this that linguists were able to translate Egyptian hieroglyphics with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, which was a text about Ptolemy V. More on that later. Aside from Berenice III, Ptolemy III and Berenice II would go on to have four other children, Arsinoe III, Alexander, Magus of Egypt, and Ptolemy IV, the latter of which would later take his heirship by purging his own family. When Ptolemy IV was crowned king, he was under the influence of two aristocrats named Sozobias and Agathocles, the latter of which was the brother of his mistress Agathocle. Under their advisement, Ptolemy was convinced that an uprising was imminent as it was believed that his younger brother Magus was the intended heir of his father, who was now deceased. Ptolemy IV had his uncle Lysimachus murdered, and soon after, his younger brother Magus was scalded to death in his bath. Magus' largest supporter, his mother Berenice II, was soon after poisoned. Little is known about his other siblings, except, of course, his sister Arsinoe III, who he later married. Ptolemy IV's reign is looked back upon as the beginning of the downfall of the Ptolemaic dynasty, as after the disastrous Fourth Syrian War with his father's enemies, the Seleucid Empire, now ruled by Antiochus III, Egypt was hemorrhaging money. This problem was only exacerbated by the fact that Ptolemy IV had very little interest in politics or the public as a whole. He was far more interested in the pomp and circumstance of being a king, throwing lavish parties, and even partaking in massive orgies almost weekly. Amid his multitudes of affairs, however, he did manage to have a child with his sister wife making Arsinoe III the first of the Ptolemaic dynasty to have her brother's son, Ptolemy V. Ptolemy V Epiphanes Eucharistos, or Ptolemy the Manifest, the Beneficent took the throne at the age of five after his parents both died of very suspicious circumstances. Though there is nothing on record to prove it, it was assumed that Agathocles, Ptolemy IV's primary mistress brother was responsible for Ptolemy's and Arsinoe's mysterious deaths, and was therefore widely reviled which led to revolution against him when he became regent of Egypt in 202 BCE. There were multiple regents appointed after the fact, but this left Egypt heavily weakened. Egypt's on-again, off-again sparring partner, the Seleucid Empire, waged war on Egypt starting the Fifth Syrian War. During the Six-Year War, the Ptolemies not only lost all of their territories in Asia Minor, but the Ptolemies simultaneously lost much of their control in Egypt because of an uprising led by revolutionary Horwenifer and his successor Anquenifer, who would control much of northern and southern Egypt until around 186 BC. Despite this train wreck, Ptolemy V was crowned as pharaoh in Memphis in 196 BC, which was an occasion commemorated in stone in the same three languages we spoke about earlier, on what came to be known as the Rosetta Stone, our modern-day tool for translating not only ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, but the spoken language of Egypt as well. Ptolemy would also finally make peace with King Antiochus III and agreed to marry his daughter, Cleopatra I. No, not the one you're thinking about. During this time, the Roman Empire had already begun to expand, and had already had their eyes on Egypt for some time. Until this point, Rome's eye had been a peaceful one, only keeping an eye on things happening so close to their own territory. This almost changed, however, with the sudden peace between Egypt and the Seleucid Empire, as Rome had recently entered hostilities with King Antiochus III, partially on behalf of Egypt in what would be known as the Roman Seleucid War. After hostilities ended between the Seleucid Empire and Egypt, the Seleucids turned Egypt's former territories in Asia Minor over to Pergamum and Rhodes, who were currently under the rule of the revolutionary Horwenifer, an act that the Romans saw as a slap in the face of Ptolemy V, and Egypt as a whole. Eventually, as mentioned before, Ptolemy V regained control over the Egyptian territories he lost to Horwenifer, which essentially handed back Egypt's Asia Minor territories. This, in turn, reinvigorated hostilities between Egypt and its Seleucid rivals. These hostilities were cut short, however, in 180 BCE when he was killed, likely by poison at the hands of those in his command who feared the cost of another Syrian war. Amid all of this, Ptolemy V and Cleopatra I had three children, Ptolemy VI, Cleopatra II, and Ptolemy VIII. And that's where the family tree that turned into a family pole, that turned back into a family tree, becomes the family pretzel I spoke about at the beginning. Now, I'm going to put a disclaimer here, because this is where it really gets complex. I'm well aware that there's a lot of information in the following section that's heavily summarized or omitted altogether. So, before any of you history nerds in the comments come at me with, um, actually this, and this, and this, and this, I am fully aware. This is supposed to be a summary of the Ptolemies, and not just Ptolemy the sixth and eighth and their dysfunctional family. As it stands, this section is already just as long as the five sections that came before it, so shut it. Ptolemy VI would take the throne at the age of 6 in 180 BCE. 
Egypt was governed by regents including his mother until her death in 178, and by her two associates Julius and Lenius until 170 BC. From there, he would marry his sister, Cleopatra II, and they would go on to rule as co-regents with their younger brother Ptolemy VIII, and would govern together. Though, I use the word governed rather loosely, as his entire reign was laden with conflict. First, the external conflict. As mentioned before, his father Ptolemy V had reignited tensions with the Seleucid Empire, and while his mother, being the daughter of the Seleucid king himself, was able to quell these tensions for some time, they seemed to have boiled over somewhere around the time that Ptolemy VIII and his siblings took control of Egypt, leading to the Sixth Syrian War, which not only saw Egypt's forces handedly defeated on foreign soil, but also saw Egypt invaded twice by Seleucid armies. With the help of the Romans, they may have been able to fend off these attacks, but at the time, the Romans were suddenly engulfed in the Third Macedonian War, which greatly lessened their ability to aid Egypt. Secondly, the internal conflict. Ptolemy VI did not have a very good relationship with his younger brother Ptolemy VIII, who had begun to quietly challenge his reign as king. Upon Egypt's defeat, the Ptolemaic government in Alexandria was dissolved. Ptolemy VI attempted to flee with the Ptolemaic treasury, but before he could, two of his own generals staged a coup against him and took control over Egypt. Antiochus IV of the Seleucid Empire marched onto Egypt where he was met by Ptolemy VI who negotiated an agreement of friendship. This essentially reduced Ptolemy VI to a client king of the Seleucid Empire. This caused riots in the streets of Alexandria, which led the new Egyptian leaders, Khamenei and Sinis, the generals who initially led the coup against Ptolemy VI, to reject the agreement and declare Ptolemy VIII as the sole king of Egypt. This decision was held up in many major cities like Alexandria, but was rejected in other cities such as Memphis that still saw Ptolemy VI as their king. When news of the rejection reached Antiochus IV, he immediately began sieging Alexandria. This attempt was unsuccessful, however, and he and his armies retreated in 169 BCE, leaving Ptolemy VIII on the throne of Alexandria, and leaving Ptolemy VI as a puppet king in Memphis. The brothers soon reconciled, however, and Ptolemy VI and his sister wife Cleopatra II returned to Alexandria. With the Ptolemies restored as rulers of Egypt and Antiochus IV's agreement with Ptolemy VI redacted, Antiochus IV once again laid siege to Egypt. Antiochus began with Memphis, and after this success, was crowned king of Egypt himself. Unfortunately for him, he did not know that the Ptolemies had been appealing not just to Rome, but also to Greece for military aid against the Seleucid armies, thus proving the age-old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Despite Rome's armies being thin, they were able to send an embassy led by Gaius Populius Lenas, who confronted Antiochus IV, forcing Antiochus to agree to a settlement which brought the war to an end. Things were not all roses and puppies, however, as the combination of the Ptolemaic military's failures during the war, as well as much of Egypt's agricultural lands being destroyed or abandoned, there was soon civil unrest which led to several uprisings over the course of the next few years. While the Ptolemies appeared strong in the public eye, there was still a rip behind the curtain that eventually led to Ptolemy VIII having his brother and sister exiled from the throne under means that have never been recorded to history. Ptolemy VI fled to Rome for aid, where it was denied, then proceeded further to Cyprus where he still had land holdings. In 163 BC, the people of Egypt had yet another uprising against Ptolemy VIII and recalled Ptolemy VI and Cleopatra II back to Egypt where they were once again coronate as king and queen. Ptolemy VIII was not completely exiled, as he was handed control of what is now eastern Libya. Like any little brother would do, Ptolemy VIII went crying to mommy and daddy, i.e., Rome for help, and Rome decided the land split was unfair, and that Ptolemy VIII ought to be handed control of Cyprus as well. This request was ignored by Ptolemy VI, however, which Ptolemy VIII thought would give him all the ammunition he needed to convince the Roman Senate to allow him to take Cyprus by force, but he was once again waved off by the Roman Senate that seemed not to want to get involved one way or the other. During all of this family drama, Ptolemy VI and Cleopatra II managed to have a few children, Ptolemy Eupater, Cleopatra Thea, Cleopatra III, and Ptolemy VII. During yet another skirmish with his brother, an agreement was met between the two denying Ptolemy VIII any rights to Cyprus, but offering him his daughter Cleopatra Thea once she came of age. In the meantime, Ptolemy VI quickly put efforts into effect to advance his eldest son Ptolemy Eupater as his heir, making him priest of Alexander in the royal cult at the age of eight, and making him full co-regent of Egypt at fourteen. Unfortunately for Ptolemy VI, Ptolemy Eupater died later that same year, leaving his next eldest child, Cleopatra III as the obvious heir, formally deifying her later in the year. Ptolemy VI would eventually use his influence under very manipulative means to cause a civil war within the Seleucid Empire, that would eventually lead to him gaining control over Seleucid Syria in the Battle of the Enebrus. Unfortunately, this victory would be both sweet and sour, as he would later die from injuries sustained in the battle. Ptolemy VIII was soon called back to Alexandria to retake the throne, which he did, and then proceeded to marry his brother's widow, his own sister, Cleopatra II. Oh yeah, and upon his return to Alexandria, he also led an army that ravaged the streets indiscriminately slaughtering innocent people in an attempt to purge all of those who opposed him in favor of his older brother. It should also be noted, although this is disputed, it was written by Justin, a contemporary Latin writer and historian. On his wedding night to his now sister wife, he murdered his nephew Ptolemy VII, and the young victim died in his mother's arms that very night. Now, with that unpleasantness out of the way, he and his new sister wife would soon give birth to their first and only child, Ptolemy Memphites. 
Ptolemy Memphites was promoted to co-regent by the late 140s, shortly before Ptolemy took a second wife, his niece, and daughter of his sister wife, Cleopatra III, and also made her co-regent of Egypt. This arrangement obviously led to conflict with Cleopatra II, who now had to share her husband with her own daughter. She managed to gain enough support to initiate a revolt against Ptolemy along with the help of a trusted officer of her late husband, Galaestus, who gathered a large army of Ptolemaic exiles in Greece. The uprising was unsuccessful, however, leading to Ptolemy VIII to issue a formal decree that he and his two wives would rule harmoniously with one another. This decree would not stick, as in 131 BCE, a civil war broke out with one side supporting Ptolemy VIII and Cleopatra III, and the other side supporting Cleopatra II as sole queen of Egypt, which she was later crowned, though controversially. She drew her support from many of the Greek and Jewish populace of Egypt, while Ptolemy VIII and Cleopatra III were supported by the native Egyptian people. As the civil war mounted, Ptolemy and Cleopatra fled to Cyprus but continued to retain the support of native Egyptians, namely a man named Paus, who had squashed the rebellion of a self-professed pharaoh named Harsisi who wanted to follow in the footsteps of the great rebellions against previous Ptolemies. Upon returning to Memphis, Ptolemy VIII and Cleopatra III named Paus a general under their command, to lead the rebellion against their sister Ante. Cleopatra II, in the meantime, still maintained strongholds across the country, and even managed to fend off a siege in Alexandria. Cleopatra II sent for her son, Ptolemy Memphites to be called back to Egypt from Cyrene in order to take the throne as king. Unfortunately, Ptolemy VIII got word of this first and managed to have Ptolemy Memphites, his own son with Cleopatra II, captured and dismembered, and had his remains sent to Cleopatra II on her birthday. Shortly after some hasty negotiations with Egypt's old pals, the Seleucids, Cleopatra II packed her treasury and fled to the court of Demetrius II. Ptolemy once again ascended the throne in Alexandria, but he soon began negotiations with Cleopatra II, which led to an agreement of marriage between Cleopatra III's daughter, Tryphena, and Demetrius II's son, Antiochus VIII. After a very long and drawn-out reconciliation, the three parties once again maintained harmony, at least in the public eye. Eventually, Ptolemy VIII died, and was succeeded by his eldest son, Ptolemy IX who served as co-regent with his mother Cleopatra III, and his aunt and grandmother, Cleopatra II. Holy jumping <coughs> balls. I told you things were about to get crazy. Now, on to Ptolemy IX. I'm just glad I don't have to type the name Cleopatra anymore. Oh wait, never mind. As mentioned before, Ptolemy IX would become co-regent of Egypt after his father's death in 116 BCE, despite one year earlier, having been sent to Cyprus in an attempt by his mother to get him out of the way, allowing his younger brother Ptolemy X to eventually gain the throne against the will of Ptolemy VIII. While serving as governor of Cyprus, Ptolemy IX would take a wife. In Ptolemaic fashion, this wife was his sister Cleopatra IV, the daughter of Ptolemy VIII and Cleopatra III. Upon the death of Cleopatra II, her daughter Cleopatra III took full control over Egypt and forced Ptolemy IX to divorce his wife Cleopatra IV, who went on to marry her cousin the Seleucid king Antiochus IX, the son of Ptolemy IX's aunt, Cleopatra Thea. Antiochus IX was still in the throes of the Seleucid civil war, and was in direct conflict with his half-brother Antiochus VIII, the husband of Cleopatra Thea's older sister Tiphaena. Aided by his new bride-to-be and an army she had recruited while in Cyprus, Antiochus IX gained a victory over his half-brother. Shortly afterward, Ptolemy X would declare himself king of Cyprus, lining himself up in full opposition to his brother Ptolemy IX. Is your head spinning yet? Give me a minute. Amid this chaos, Ptolemy IX was married once again, this time to his younger sister Cleopatra Selene, and the two had a daughter named Berenice III. Despite the marriage, the official royal co-regents remained Ptolemy IX and his mother Cleopatra III. Ptolemy IX continued his support of Antiochus IX in his conflict with his half-brother Antiochus VIII. In 114 BCE, Antiochus VIII's wife Tryphena, Cleopatra Thea's older sister, captured and killed Cleopatra IV. In retribution, Antiochus IX murdered Tryphena only three years later. Ptolemy IX would continue to be the official king of Egypt until 107 BCE, where continued conflicts with his mother would finally boil over. Cleopatra III would have a number of her eunuch servants wounded and use them as evidence that Ptolemy IX had attempted to assassinate her. The people of Alexandria bought the story and began to riot, causing Ptolemy IX to flee the city, leaving behind his two sons and his wife Cleopatra Selene. Not long after, Ptolemy X returned to Alexandria, once again taking the throne as king, and taking Cleopatra Selene as his own wife. Soon after his mother's treachery, Ptolemy IX would retake control of the island of Cyprus, but his control wouldn't last long, as his half-brother Ptolemy Apion, son of Ptolemy VIII and Irene of Cyrene, would regain control of the territory. Apion held this territory by leaving it to Rome in his will, should he end up dying without an heir. This was a common tactic of rulers at the time to quell attacks from their enemies for fear of Rome taking control of a region. Apion's plan would backfire, though, as he would eventually die without a living heir, thus leaving Cyprus under Roman control. While in retreat, Ptolemy IX would receive a request for help from the region of Ptolemy Ago, who were being sieged by the new Hasmonean king Alexander Janius. Ptolemy IX was successful in fighting off the invasion, but continued to follow Janius into Galilee where he defeated him decisively, and took control over Judea. Not about to let Ptolemy IX get the jump on them, Ptolemy X and his mother, Cleopatra III decided to act first. They jumped into action with Ptolemy X invading Phoenicia, then marching inland to Damascus while his mother marched onto Ptolemy Ago, hoping to back Ptolemy IX into a corner. Unfortunately, 
Ptolemy IX used this opportunity to march back into Egypt where he was met by his younger brother, and was unsuccessful. This is when he retreated to Cyprus, and unfortunately for us, all history pertaining to his life is gone to time until 88 BC. In 88 BC, he was recalled to Alexandria after the expulsion of his younger brother Ptolemy X. After once again being crowned pharaoh in Memphis and taking back his throne in Alexandria, Ptolemy IX sent massive forces to the south where Egyptian rebels had taken control three years earlier. Ptolemy IX quickly promoted his daughter, Berenice III to co-regent, who had been married to Ptolemy X after his divorce of Ptolemy IX's ex-wife Cleopatra Selene. Ptolemy IX died soon afterward, leaving the throne solely to Berenice III. She was soon joined by her cousin Ptolemy XI, son of Cleopatra Selene, who would eventually murder her before being murdered himself. He was soon replaced by Ptolemy XII, an illegitimate son of the late Ptolemy IX, and whose mother's identity is currently lost to history. Okay, guys, we're almost there. Hang in there. Let's try to speed our way through this next one since we have some convenient gaps in history. Ptolemy XII ruled from 80 to 58 BC and then again from 55 to 51 BC. He married a relative of his, historians are unsure if it was a sister or a cousin, named, you guessed it, Cleopatra V. The two had a daughter together named Berenice IV, and most likely had a second daughter together named Cleopatra VII, though it is unknown if Cleopatra V was her actual mother. Ptolemy XII would have a further three children born to an unknown mother, Arsinoe IV, Ptolemy XIII, and Ptolemy XIV. Ptolemy XII affirmed himself as an ally of Rome, probably due to the debt incurred by his predecessor Ptolemy IX. His predecessor Ptolemy X also incurred debt to Rome, even leaving Egypt to Rome in the event that he'd die without a successor. Rome opted not to take complete control of Egypt, however, though they did eventually annex Cyprus. Shortly after the annexation of Cyprus, the people of Egypt turned on Ptolemy XII, causing him to flee to Rome, and causing his eldest daughter Berenice IV to take the throne. Rome came to his assistance soon after, allowing him to take back control of Egypt. Upon taking back the throne, he had his eldest daughter Berenice IV killed, naming his daughter Cleopatra VII as his co-regent. Egypt was unfortunately in crippling debt to Rome after Ptolemy XII took back his throne, which led him to raise taxes upon Alexandrian citizens. Wisely, though, he shifted the blame to Rome by appointing a Roman creditor Gaius Rubirius Posthumus to Minister of Finance. He would later restore Egypt faith in him by imprisoning Rubirius for, you know, doing his job. He did, however, allow him to escape shortly afterward, and Rubirius fled to Rome. Ptolemy would die in 51 BCE leaving the throne to Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XIII to rule Egypt. He also made the people of Rome the executors of his will, which was a contractual move approved by his Roman ally Pompey, who we'll surely get to later. Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XIII would take the throne in 51 BCE, but the two would soon clash leading to yet another civil war in Egypt, leading to Cleopatra VII to flee into exile. How this civil war would have turned out without assistance from Rome is unknown, but Ptolemy XIII wrote his own fate. After losing the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BCE against Julius Caesar, Roman statesman Pompey, an ally of Ptolemy XII fled to Egypt. Unfortunately, upon his arrival, he was ambushed and beheaded at the request of Ptolemy XIII. He did this in hopes of gaining the favor of Rome in his civil war against his sister Cleopatra VII by presenting Pompey's head to Caesar upon his arrival in Egypt. This backfired, however, since even though Pompey was an enemy of Caesar, he was still considered a citizen of Rome, causing Caesar to take great offense to his murder. Likely because of this, Caesar sided in favor of Cleopatra's claim to the throne, causing Ptolemy XIII to lead a siege on the palace of Alexandria. The siege failed, however, and soon after Ptolemy XIII would die in the Battle of the Nile in 47 BC, Cleopatra VII and her brother Ptolemy XIV would take the throne as co-regents. While she remained co-regent with her brother Ptolemy XIV, she would continue a relationship with Caesar and act as an Egyptian representative to Rome, along with their son Caesarion, whose real name was Ptolemy XV Caesar. In 44 BC, she would order the assassination of her brother Ptolemy XIV, likely by poisoning. Unfortunately, in that same year, Julius Caesar was also famously assassinated by the Roman Senate, leaving Ptolemy XV fatherless. Cleopatra would still name Ptolemy XV as the successor to the throne in Egypt. Caesar's assassination started the Liberators' civil war between the second triumvirate forces of Mark Antony and Octavian, against the conspirators of Caesar's assassination, led by Junius Brutus and Cassius Longinus. Cleopatra would obviously side with those fighting on behalf of her former lover Caesar, and soon after the Roman Second Triumvirate won the war against Caesar's conspirators, Cleopatra would begin a relationship with Mark Antony. The relationship was first private, but would soon become public with Cleopatra's pregnancy and her marriage to Mark Antony. Unfortunately, this would cause a rift between Mark Antony and his ally Octavian, namely after Antony's divorce from Octavian's sister Octavia Minor which started the final war of the Roman Republic. Octavian's propaganda campaign against Mark Antony led to Antony's allies to flee Rome, and war was officially declared on Cleopatra. After the naval battle of Actium, Antony and Cleopatra retreated to Egypt. Less than one year later, Octavian invaded Egypt, leading to Antony's suicide. Not long after, Cleopatra learned that she was going to be brought before a Roman triumphal procession, and subsequently poisoned herself. Cleopatra's legacy as the last of the Ptolemies survives today, and though divisive at times, she is still considered one of history's smartest and most engaging women. She was extremely well-educated, and was even the first of the Ptolemies to speak the name native language of Egypt, both in spoken form, and in hieroglyphs. Aside from that, she also spoke Greek, and the languages of the Parthians, Jews, Medes, Syrians, Ethiopians, and Arabs despite what the preceding generations of genetic abuse must have done to her DNA. This was the Ptolemaic dynasty, and holy <coughs> we did it, thanks for watching.